folks, welcome back to the first Token Punch Lunch. Uh, the name has changed, but the show is going to remain the same. Uh, we wanted to do that to be, I don't know, you know, slightly more, I guess you could say, welcoming with the title of the show. And it has the ring of a board game E type show uh, because of the, you know, every game that has tokens you got to punch them out of the the, the the token boards right so token punch lunch that's what settled on there was really no question after just a couple of days of voting on last week's or rather the last episode's comment section i think we ended up with somewhere around 150 or something like that votes 140 something like that votes for for token punch lunch and uh tropical punch lunch did just could not keep up with the volume of votes that Token Punch Lunch was getting, which, you know, kind of makes sense. It does have the board game theme wrapped around the, the, the name still, uh, and it also carries the caveat that I wanted to keep the acrostic of TPL, just because that's what I call it uh, as often as I can. So that is the name of the show now, Token Punch Lunch. I'm going to be redoing the introduction and all that kind of stuff. I just didn't have time to do that with all of the time we spent at Origins last week and uh, trying to get this up as soon as possible this week. So I do apologize for that, but I'll be reworking the intro as soon as I can. Uh, and we'll, uh, it's not going to be a complete overhaul because like the title says, this is still the same show. Show, uh, it just has a different uh, title to it, that's all. So, without further ado, let's go ahead and get to the segments that have been created for this inaugural episode. Is that right? Inaugural? Yes, I think so. Of Token Punch Lunch. Let's hit it. are divided into a couple rooms cues split up in red and blue two everyone holds a secret and i don't really know what the others need, need to do. do you the president is hoping to stay hidden away throughout the game the best way he can stay alive and unhurt the bomber is conspiring with allies everywhere we're all attempting to subvert can i make it in the room where it happens the room where it happens the room Make it in the room where it happens. That one claims. I am with you and I'll give you whatever you need, so please vote for me to leave. That one claims. I am with you, but that other one is not, so give it to me and we will succeed. That one claims. I'll suggest hostages to send. Let's go with this one, and I hope we are all agreed. That one claims. Well, I don't care who loses. I don't care who leads it. Who needs it? Who chooses? But can I make it in the room? succeed you another one approaches and we start a discussion say maybe we could share without much repercussion maybe we can share our colors with each other and there's no need to share the rest of it or question it i'm blue i see you too what to do wouldn't you like to share with me the rest of your card actually i would well i'm the real president and i have your pills in my hand well let's stick to the plan here man can i stay out of the room where it happens Stay out of the room where it happens Switch over the hostages Time to decide on who you're choosing This time hurry, pick out who you're sending Switch over the hostages Is this the one, pick the one you're trusting Do you send over the one who's just pretending 
switch over the hostages. Well, now it's done and you're here, so want to show me what you've got behind that card you hold. Well, I want to know the info you've got. You share yours with us first. Yeah, let's listen to your thoughts. When you reveal your team, I'll show you my team. But we won't make a deal unless we're both the same team. So you come talk with us and compare with us. You get nothing till you share with a share with a share. God, so unrelenting. You're gonna keep asking till I start assenting. I, I cannot be in the room where it happens. The room where it happens. I, I cannot be in the room where it happens. The room where it happens. I, I cannot be in the room where it happens. Got play. We hope our leaders can save the day. Don't get a say in who they send away. We'll find out the final rules. And we'll see you to those got the win goals. You'll hear the boom where it happens. Who's gonna be in the room? Where it happens. Who's gonna be? Who's gonna be? Who's gonna be in the room? This is Roy Candy from Epic Gaming Night, and this is why it's there. We're taking a look at a game in my collection and why it's stuck around on my shelves. And today I'm talking about a living card game that has tons of theme and tons of campaign and story in it, and that is Arkham Horror LCG. I just got finished playing the Dunwich Legacy campaign for this game, and it is a total blast. I really enjoy playing this game. This is one of the few games that I actually play solo. So I played through the whole game by myself, which is kind of crazy because most people would think, oh, when you play a solo game, it's kind of fun. Some people are really into it. Some people would rather play video games, but this is one that's really great to play because there's just so much theme and story as you play through. You get to do deck building as you go along, and it's really simple deck building because you're just getting a little bit of experience points and upgrading your deck as you're going along, which is really cool to like figure out how to min-max that deck and go through the campaign, but there's tons of story as you go through this game. Like things that happen on future like scenarios and future stories will come back later in the scenario and like have impact on how your game went. There's multiple like ways to win the different scenarios. You can like be really combat heavy or just try to get the clues and go through it real quick. There's all sorts of ways to play, which makes it super exciting. And there's tons of different investigators you can play as. So that makes the replayability crazy, especially if you're playing it solo. You can like play this guy or that guy. I just started the um, Carcosa. Um, it's like Path to Carcosa cycle, um, and I'm actually playing that with one of my friends, which is going to be cool to play it as a two-player experience as well, so that'll add a whole new dynamic of like working together and trying to figure out the best way to do things. So definitely the Lovecraft theme comes through in the Arkham Horror LCG. If you're a fan of that whole mythos of like creepy weird things happening and being an investigator and exploring different locations and trying to solve the clues of what weird strange things are happening and how to put an end to it and rest you then save the day um, while trying to not go insane at the same time. This is a great game for that. And the cool thing is it's a cooperative LCG, so you don't have to keep up. You can play it at your own pace. I'm like way behind on the packs, but I just buy them. After I finish a scenario, I'll buy the next one. And maybe it'll be a month or two. And after I finish that scenario, then I buy the next one. And it just makes it so you can casually play the game and play it at your own pace and still have a lot of fun with the story. So Arkham Horror LCG is definitely staying on my shelves. Hey everybody, it's Jay, and it's time to talk about your flair. On 15 Pieces of Flair, I'm going to show you guys some ways to spruce up that game room. Real quick, I want to thank anybody who contacted me, made sure I was alright, made sure my family was alright while I had to take my little break. Um, thanks for anybody who asked about me or anything like that. I appreciate anybody taking the time to do that, so thanks everybody. But I'm back baby, and let's get back to business. 
Sometimes I'll be out shopping and I'll just get inspiration from random items. Hey, maybe I can make something board game related out of that. That looks awesome, maybe I could use that for something. One day I saw a perfect 12-sided lamp and I thought that has to be made into a board game. Piece of flair. So I asked on the Dice Tower Facebook group, the number one game people wanted me to make this 12-sided die lamp into and of course it was dead of winter. So I did that, let's check it out. So for this project, we're gonna need a lamp, an electric sander, some masking tape and paper, some string, cherry red spray paint, vinyl decals, and a lampshade. First, I took the electric sander and sanded each side of the lamp. I did this to ensure a better bond with the paint later. After each side was sanded, I wiped the entirety of the surfaces with a damp paper towel. Then, I removed the bottom cover. Then, using the masking tape and paper, I masked off the neck and cord of the lamp. I also had to go ahead and attach my string for hanging at this time. In a well-ventilated area, outside in this case, I painted the entire vase, always being sure to use quick and wispy bursts to prevent runs. After the first coat dried, I applied another coat. Once that was totally dry, I went ahead and removed all the masking. Then I applied each decal. Now you can put them on randomly, but I tried to do exactly how the die looked, so I took a few extra minutes to replicate it precisely. Once those are all on, you can attach your lampshade and throw in a bulb and you're good to go. Boom, there you have it. A quick and easy way to add some flair to your game room. Now this is gonna end up being a gift for John Gilmore. I'm glad that I can actually give him something back because this Dead of Winter game is one of my probably top five favorite games of all time. We, we've had so much fun with it. I'll never forget the time we lost on the very first turn from a chain reaction of just rolling that tooth over and over from the first attack. But anyways, I love this lamp. It is probably one of my favorite pieces of flair I've made so far. Anyways, guys, on my Facebook page, I'm almost at 500 likes. Once I hit 500, I'm gonna give away a pretty sweet flair package and game package. I know I'm gonna do at least all of the unlocked games plus a bunch of flair. So if you want in on that, check out my Facebook page, give it a like, and I appreciate that. Hey, if you guys have any suggestions on games or ideas you'd like me to make into some flair, leave them in the comments below. I read them every time, or my Facebook page, or any other social media platform. Don't forget guys, 15 pieces of flair is the bare minimum. Some people choose to do more, and we encourage that. Especially the dude. Have fun everybody. Hello fellow Throat Punch launchers. I am here with none other than uh, Tom Vassell. Uh, thank you for joining me in this segment. <laughs> Sam, I'm on your show! <laughs> uh, the idea for me is, as I said, we're at UKGE right now. The idea for me with this segment, as I've said, is to promote Poland and Polish board game scene all over the world through Truth for Punch Lunch, which Sam was kind enough to let me do. So I figured I've done a couple of those, so probably you are pretty well versed, all of you, in, uh, in Polish board gaming scene. So sure. I, thought, I, saw, I thought I prepared a short, I prepared a short quiz Oh. And I was wondering if it's those three questions. I think at least one of them is really easy. So the first one. I have four games for you. Which one of those was not design, designed by a Polish person? Oh, man. <laughs> Imperial, oh, no. Imperial Settlers. Okay. This War of Mine. Right. Lords of Hellas. Uh-huh. Tides of Time. Which was not designed by a Polish person. Oh, well, this is tricky. Uh, I'll go with Tides of Time. Perfect, that's correct. Woo! Who designed it? I don't even know. <laughs> uh, Christian Kula, he's from Czech Republic, I think. <laughs> oh my oh, God. All right, all right, all right. <laughs> I'm pretty sure he's from Czech Republic. Okay, the second question. Which Polish publisher released K2, which is a, a game I know you like? A Portal Games, no. Rebel, or G3? G3. No, it was Rebel. 
It was yeah, Rebel. One of the it was one of the most popular Rebel games. You're right. You're right. <laughs> okay, so it wasn't. It wasn't. Um, you're right. It wasn't. Okay. <laughs> it wasn't. I won. I won. I got the first one. And and I'll, I think you'll get the third one. Uh, you, I'm pretty sure you're familiar with Ignacy Trevichek. Oh, I was about to shout Trevichek for some answer. <laughs> All right. Yes. Well, in the in this com well, he's working on a game with another big name designer. There are the chances are they're pretty big that they're gonna release it next year through Portal Games. Now, what is the name of that designer? Is it A. Juve Rosenberg, B. Eric Lang, or C. Bruno Catala? Well, it can't be Eric Lang because he only does stuff for. C-Mod now, and I can't imagine Uwe working with anybody, so I'm going to have to go with the last one. <laughs> it's actually Eric Lang. Really? Yeah, they're good. it was when he when he was hired by uh, Simon like full time. They basically they uh, he ditched all of his projects he had working out out somewhere else apart from this one because they were so far along. You know, they probably told me this and I forgot. <laughs> Well, no, this just proves that I still have, still have a lot of work to do, but one of our three, you got right. So this just proves I, I have a very good grade. <laughs> well, but this, like I said, I still have a lot of work to do with promoting Poland all over the world uh, and through Dice Tower. So I'll just keep on doing that. And we'll meet here next year for another quiz. All right. <laughs> for your breakfast forever. <laughs> thank you, Tom, so much. Uh, thank you, Sam Kelly, once again for inviting me to be a part of the show. And see you guys next time. Pavel Kaczmarek from Geek Factor. Bye. Hey, hey, welcome to the show. My name is Bobby, and this is these Totally Geeky Games, where I make recommendations of games for those geeky friends of ours with interests outside of our hobby. Our hobby being tabletop board and card games, and the interest this week being Star Wars. Uh, last episode, I did a Star Wars-inspired list with the release of the Han Solo movie. I did my top uh, Firefly games that I would recommend to Firefly fans. This week, I decided to just bite the bullet, and I'm going to give you my list of top five games that I would recommend to Star Wars fans. Top five board board games at least. Um, if you've ever taken a college speech course, you're taught that you're supposed to give your qualifications for giving a list such like this when you're making a speech. I am going to start off by giving you my unqualifications. I think it'd be constructive for us um, to know where my knowledge kind of falls short. Uh, here are some of the games that I haven't played. Um, I haven't played Star Wars Queen's Gambit. I haven't played Star Wars Legion. Um, I've only played Star Wars Destiny maybe once or twice. Um, I haven't played the Star Wars CCG game, and I haven't played Star Wars Armada. Those are games that I haven't played, so they won't be featured on the list, but there's a ton of other Star Wars games out there, so no worries. Um, I also grew up thinking that the prequels were the Star Wars movies. Those were the movies that I went to the theaters to see. So, of course, I've watched the original trilogy and do have an appreciation for them, um, but I grew up enjoying all the Star Wars movies, even Jar Jar Binks in a movie. Um, and I grew up... Um, I'm even, I go to the theater now and watch Force Awakens and Last Jedi and still enjoy it, which according to some pockets of the internet means that I don't know what I'm talking about. But if you're still with me, here are my qualifications for giving this list and it's simple and it's just one. I have introduced, uh, Star Wars board games to Star Wars fans, um, that were friends of mine. So if that's good enough for you, here are the five games that I would recommend to them. Five, I would recommend the Star Wars LCG game put out by um, Fantasy Flight and designed by Eric Lang. This is a fun game. Um, there's a little bit of dissonance with the theme um, and the mechanics. It's kind of weird if you have an X-Wing fighting against Obi-Wan with a lightsaber. But it's still a lot of fun and you get to manipulate cards uh, within the Star Wars universe. So it's a good one-on-one -on -one combative lcg game uh the number four game that i would introduce to them is star wars x-wing miniatures game uh star wars x-wing miniatures game is a cool miniatures game that if um you think they'd like that kind of game and you want to get them into the hobby that way um star wars x-wing is a great way to go you could have a lot of fun with just the starter set and just a few more ships and who knows they might delve into the hobby head first and get more into x-wing than you um which might end up being the only game they play but hey at least you'll have a buddy that plays x-wing with you and probably bought more ships than you will um so x-wing miniatures game is a cool game and maybe this will help legitimize me with star wars fans if they like the n64 game rogue squadron they might like uh star wars x-wing miniatures game that's a pretty obscure pull from n64 although true star wars fans will tell me it's not that obscure of a game 
All right. Okay. Okay. Um, star- my number three pick is not an obscure game either. That is Star Wars Risk. That's right. I got a game with Risk written in big letters across the front of the box. Star Wars Risk. Um, but this game is... Um, people have said that it's kind of a spiritual successor to Queen's Gambit. Now, I haven't played that game. But it's a cool card-driven combat game, uh, one-on-one set in the Star Wars original trilogy um, time period. Um, it's a fun game, and it, it's um, it's a little bit more advanced than other Risk games, but if you bring that out to somebody, they won't be intimidated at least because they'll recognize a name on the box other than Star Wars. They'll recognize Risk. Uh, so I think it's a good game to introduce to people. Number two game is if you have somebody that's willing to sit down for a little longer and learn a little bit more rules and maybe won't be intimidated by so much of a grandiose game, I would introduce them to Star Wars Imperial Assault. Star Wars Imperial Assault is a Star Wars themed dungeon crawl. And so if you think they'd like those kinds of games, introduce them to this game and have a lot of fun. You could skirmish one-on-one or you could do a campaign. Um, and at this point, there's a AI dungeon master that you could utilize through the app that you could download for free. Um, so Star Wars Imperial Assault is a really good one. Um, but my number one, probably all-time Star Wars board game and the number one game that I'd recommend to anybody that's really willing to sit down and learn a strategic, deep, epic game is Star Wars Rebellion. Star Wars Rebellion is by far the coolest, immersive, thematic Star Wars game. And if you have a fan that's Star Wars, if you have a friend that's a Star Wars fan, and maybe they're a fan of like real-time strategy video games like uh, the Starcraft, Warcraft, or something like that, then I think they would really enjoy Star Wars Rebellion. Um, Anyway, that's my list of top five Star Wars games that I'd recommend to a Star Wars geek that isn't a board game geek necessarily. Um, What would you recommend? Tell me what I missed, because I missed a ton of games. Um, So let me know in the comments, and until the next show, this has been These Totally Geeky Games with Bobby. Bye. I'm Julie. Today I'm going to give you my review of Corolla. Corolla is a two to five abstract tile laying game where you're creating platforms in different colors for your elephants to move on. Most games can be played in about 20 to 30 minutes. I'll talk about the goal of the game first. The goal of Corolla is to score the most points. One way to get the most points is to place all five colors, place tiles with elephants, correctly place bonus tiles, and do not pass on a tile. The game of Corolla can be difficult to learn at first. Each player chooses a color with matching elephants and corresponding starting tile. Before starting the game, a certain amount of tiles will be removed from the game bag, depending on how many people are playing. After this has been taken care of, the game can start. In the beginning, someone draws two to five tiles from the bag, depending on the number of players. The first player chooses a tile they want. Then the next player chooses a tile. This continues until everyone has picked a tile. After the player chooses their tile, they have to place it next to another tile that one of your elephants is on, horizontally or vertically adjacent. Everyone takes turn being the first player to choose a tile. This continues until there are no more tiles in the bag and the game is scored to see who wins. Play interaction is at a medium level. I find this to be a very competitive game. Since the play area is visible to all the players, it's easy to take a tile that you know would help your competitor improve their score. In other words, it can be a breeze to mess with your opponent. The rules were a bit confusing for me. At first, I found Corolla hard to learn. I kind of struggle with abstract games. However, after quite a few playthroughs, I finally got the hang of it and found it easy to play. It can be tricky learning how to place your tiles and remembering to move your elephants, especially if abstract games are hard for you. I like the components of the game. The elephants are easy to move, being of chunky wood. The tiles are also thick, which make them easy to pick up and move around. They are really sturdy. It takes no time at all to set up. It can take one to two times of playing before it becomes easy to play. For someone new to the game, it can take time teaching the importance of grouping the color tiles to gain the most elephants on the tiles for points. Overall, I really like Corolla. In fact, it's when I choose when my husband asks, what game do you want to play? I don't have to be talked into playing it at all. It's fun to see how your playing area starts and finishes because it's never the same game each time it is played. I highly recommend this to all of you. I think it's a super fun family game. 
Thank you for taking time to watch Joel's Reviews. I'm Julie. Have a great day. Hi, welcome to Board Game Opinions. My name's Steve Rain. I'm Jonathan Hicks. And I'm Martin. And uh, this month's flavour of the month is Where Words, a game that's based on a game called Insider, but it's basically 20 questions with some hidden roles as well. Uh, to start the game, we've got a six player game. This app will help you play. It's a free app you can get. And you deal some cards out, and everyone's going to have a look at what secret roles they are. Whoever's the mayor puts their card face up, and they become the seventh card, which is put in the middle. So Mark will also have a look at what his role is. And in the game, there are various roles. You've got the mayor who's open knowledge and the mayor will use this app using different word lists to pick a word that might that, that effectively everyone else has got to guess. So Mark might select the word, he might select the word bucket or something like that. Um, and then everyone else starting with this player will ask Mark some yes or no questions. So they might go is it alive and Mark would hand one of these two-sided tokens out he would say no. The next person says, is it man-made? And Mark might go, yes. And you're going around and you've got effectively four minutes to try and get to the point where someone says, is it a bucket? And Mark would then go, correct. So as a villager, in fact, most of the people are villagers, the villagers are trying to get the word. The werewolf, which is in this case, Jonathan, is trying to make sure we don't get the word. And Jonathan also gets to see what the word is. So Jonathan will open his eyes when everyone else has got their eyes closed and see the words bucket. And as the questions are coming round, he'll go, or is it, um, is it smaller than a box? And which is a very misleading question because obviously a box is, you know, subjective or whatever, or a bucket's subjective. And he'll be asking dodgy questions. I, on the other hand, there was also going to be a sea, and that was me in this case. And the sea will also wake up when everyone else has got their eyes closed and see what the word is. And the sea is on the villagers team, trying to deflect the questions back towards what the right answer might be, trying to help the villagers. Until one of two things happens. If in the four minutes we guess what the word is, the werewolf will reveal themselves they will have 15 seconds to identify who they thought the seer is. It could even be the mayor himself. And they will identify who they think the seer is. If they're right, they win. If they're wrong, the villagers win. Or we don't get the word in the four minutes. The word is then revealed here. Everyone keeps their cards face down and we all get to vote who we think the werewolf is. Who's been the most unhelpful as this game's gone on. And if we get the werewolf, the villagers win. If we don't, the werewolf wins. So in both situations, you've kind of got that one last vote to see who wins. What do we think? It's nice because as these tokens are being handed out, you can see if someone's got a pile of no's in front of them, they've been asking very unhelpful questions, <laughs> eh, there's a good chance they might be a werewolf. So you actually have quite a bit of information by the time it gets to the end of the game. The addition of the tokens is really nice. Yeah. Mm. I love the 20 questions thing though. It's very simple, very straightforward. Oh, what could it be this? Could it be this? You're trying to work out all different things. But the addition of the roles really elevates this. Um, I've had a great fun playing this game. The most bizarre theme I think I saw of any game when it was first announced. Of, so they're getting started, but they're put, but basically they're putting werewolves on it because all the werewolf lines are getting at the moment. But because of the roles, it kind of works. You have got somebody, a seer, who knows the word. You have got a werewolf who's trying to... And the way the roles just do make it much better than inside. I think they add more variability and make it just more going on, more thought or... One advantage in this game as to other social deduction games that I've seen is that beginners can play this very easily. They all know 20 questions. They all know what they have to do. If they think, oh, I'm a villager. Oh, brilliant, I'm a villager. I can just try and focus on the word. Where in a lot of other games, if you're kind of the, the bread and butter role that doesn't do anything at night, you kind of feel, well, I don't really know what's going on if everyone else is doing stuff. And also, you don't need to lie as much. You can just be slightly devious. You can just be slightly bad at the game if you're the werewolf. Um, and also, you don't need to know all these hundreds of other roles that are going on in the game and what order they wake up in. So if you want like to introduce a new player to come sort of social deduction game, this is a perfect game to do that to. I think I enjoy being a villager more than anything else. I've been playing it over the weekend, I went away with my family, we've been playing it loads, it's just great. Yeah. Okay, that is our flavour of the month, Werewords. Thank you very much for watching. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Cardboard Herald's Rook and Record, where I pick the awesomest soundtrack for yours and my favorite board games. And today we are stepping into the arena with 
Catacombs and Castles, the amazing dexterity deathmatch, the team-based extravaganza for two to eight players where whether you are playing head-to-head -head, 1v1 or you are playing with a full complement of eight players, you have a series of combatants on a team facing off against another in this freaking coliseum. It feels like a sport taking place in the world of catacombs and castles. And you want something that is getting your adrenaline going, your blood pumping, that's uplifting and collaborative. You want freaking anthems, and there is no better anthem album, no better sports album, really, than ACDC's freaking Back in Black. This is one of the ultimate rockers of all time and a really interesting album in ACDC's catalog. Seriously, like check out the production work on this album and how it's been used since. But beyond that, from the first bell toll, when you feel like epic stuff is going to go down to the very end with rock and roll ain't noise pollution where you are just trying to recuperate from all the destruction that just happened to every single banger in between ranging from one of the best rock songs of all time in Shook Me All Night Long to frickin' Back in Black itself. Yeah, this album is non-stop uplifting hard rock adrenaline. Not to mention frickin' Angus Young is on fire. So if you are looking for something that's going to be high energy, something that's going to get you ready for stepping into the arena, if you are wanting the perfect soundtrack to listen to while playing Catacombs and Frickin' Castles, an incredible dexterity game, then you need to look no further than ACDC's Back in Black. Let me know what you thought of our pick. Let me know what you think of Catacombs and Castles. And let me know what game you want Rook and Recordified next. Thank you so much for watching. I've been Jack for the Cardboard Herald. And the more that we do of these, the less bad music you will have to suffer at the table. Hey gamers, this is Liz Davidson from Beyond Solitaire, and I'm here to bring you another episode of Solo Thrash, a mere thrash gaming for those of us who like to play alone. This week, I want to talk about Street Masters Rise of the Kingdom, a cooperative game by Adam and Brady Sadler. Street Masters is basically what would happen if Double Dragon and Sentinels in the Multiverse had a love child. Um, this is a game where you are a top-notch fighter who is trying to defeat a boss and his minions that will appear in the stage. And there's several different stages, there are several different fighters, and there are several different bosses and their minions to fight. So this is a game where you're actually working with these multiple different decks of cards, which is why it's like Sentinels of the Multiverse, that interact to create your gameplay experience. So every fighter will have a deck of their own specific cards that show their strengths and weaknesses and have their own really interesting combos that you'll discover as you continue to play. The enemies are controlled by the enemy deck and every boss and his team play a little bit differently. So you're gonna have a different experience as you combine, diff combine different fighters and different bosses. And beyond that, there's even further differentiation because of the stages. So this game is not a pure beat-em-up. Every stage is also going to come with objectives that your enemy is trying to achieve. And it is not only your job to defeat your enemy and just hit them, it's your job to prevent them from getting what they want. Because if they get what they want before you can stop them, you're still going to lose even if you haven't been beaten down yet. All of these factors combined to create a really exciting game, one that actually surprised me with how much fun I was having with it. One of the other very interesting aspects of this game is that when you attack, you do roll dice. However, unlike in some games where that can be really frustrating, you actually get something out of every die you roll, whether you roll what you wanted to or not. So there's several different kinds of damage in this game, but the basic three are grapple, kick, and punch. So each player specializes in doing different types, depending on what cards they're playing. And in order to see what hits you get, 
you roll these dice. So some of them are critical hits, some of them are hits. Sometimes you get a defense. And what this means is that you didn't hit your enemy, but what you did manage to do was get a defense token. So these tokens go on your card and they can be used not only to block damage later, but when you do block damage, they help charge up your character. Defend from enough hits, charge yourself up enough, and you get to flip your card and use your supercharged special ability just like you would in an old school fighting game. I would say that Street Masters is one of the most entertaining games I've played so far this year. I'm very, very glad that I ended up with a copy of it. And while it's not retail yet, the game has shipped to Kickstarter backers and should be available in store soon. So if this looks like your sort of thing, I actually really recommend that you take a look. It scales from one to four players. It plays just as well with one as it does with four. So whether you're a solo player, somebody who likes to play two-handed solo, or someone who wants to beat up some bad guys with their friends, this is a, a really good game to have a look at. Happy gaming. Hey everyone, this is Tim Jeanette, the Metal Meeple, and this is the Budget Board Game Breakdown. So one thing I'm actually kind of surprised I haven't covered on the budget board game breakdown is math trading. If you're not familiar with what math trading is, you obviously know what trading is. It's where you trade a game for another game that somebody else has. In a math trade, think about having hundreds of people and thousands of games and there's a lot of trades going on. Uh, a program actually calculates the outcome of who gets what and what you give to other people. So. For instance, if you had, let's just take a small math trade of three people. If person A wants person B's game, but B doesn't want person A's game, however, B wants C's game, but they don't want, you know, so person A would trade to B, to B would trade to C, C would trade to A, etc. so that no one's really doing a direct trade. Now, direct trades can happen in math trades, but typically they're rare. So if you're familiar, if you want to learn more about math trading, if you go to uh, BoardGameGeek.com, under the forums, you'll see the trade section. Under here, there's a bunch of pinned posts on how to do math trades for dummies and things like that. It's a lot of information, but it's super easy to get through. What's typically going to happen is you're going to have no-ship math trades at places like conventions, and those are the best places to go about it because you don't have to pay shipping. So at the end, you just go there, you trade games, and that's it. There are shipping math trades, but you have to, you know, pay money to send those off. So what's going to happen is a trade organizer is going to set up an entire math trade. The first thing that's going to happen is they're going to give everyone probably a couple of weeks to go on and add their games as a geek list item to the math trade under the trade forum for this thing. Say, for instance, Gen Con. Gen Con will have a math trade thing, and you're going to add your, uh, your, your items as geek list items. <clears throat> Then at the end of that two weeks, and by the way, any games that you add doesn't mean that you have to submit one, uh, lists for them and that you don't have to trade them, but you are putting them into a pool that the system is going to use for you to sign out what you might want to get for what, right? So you put all your items on this geek list. At the end of the, the, the time frame, they're, they're going to pull all those into one of two programs, Abercorn or the on online want list generator, so LLWLG, and let's just say it goes on the online want list generator. It goes into a giant list, and it gives everybody a week to go through and say, okay, Rising Sun, I put a check mark there, I want Rising Sun, and it brings up a whole list of all your games, and you select which ones you're willing to give up for it. Now, in the end, it's going to be one for one, but you're saying these are all the ones I'm okay with if I give away one, all these are okay to give away for this. So you can kind of use that as a, um, you know, if, if you want to do the value thing where this game is a small game, I don't want to give it away for, or like a big game, I don't want to give it away for a small game. You can do that or whatever. Or if it's just a game you don't like, whatever you want to do. I'm okay with giving up anything on this list that I check for this one game. You go through this entire list and you do all these check boxes and what you want, what you're willing to give up for it. And then at the end of that time frame, 
the it's going to end and the trade organizer is going to run this through a trade maximizing program that's going to generate a list for you if you got trades that were successful. Typically, it's about a 20 to 30 percent ratio to what you put in. So if you put in 100 games, you're only going to trade 20 to 30 games. So it's going to tell you, you want to give away all these games to these users and you want to receive all these games from all these users. And the coolest thing about it is it literally is one person's trash is another person's treasure because anything that you put in this list, you're okay with giving up and anything that you check, you're okay with receiving. So both, both ends, unless somebody just goes on there and is not really caring what they check mark, that's a different story. But for the most part, if people put time in, into it you're going to give up stuff you don't want and get stuff you do want. It's just simply amazing, especially the no ship options because you don't have to spend money and it's like super ultimate budget board game because you just get rid of the stuff you don't like, you get new stuff in. It's just awesome. I love math trading. I've been doing it for a few years now and I just, I have so much fun with it. It's really good. Everyone's pretty honest. I mean, there's only a couple of instances that's ever happened that I know of and I wasn't even in the math trading at that time. So if you have any questions, feel free to post below. If you've ever done math trading, tell us your thoughts or experiences. And if you want, email me at timjanette at gmail.com. Follow me on social media. Check out my podcast, Meeple Core. And until next time, keep on rocking and rolling dice. Hi, I'm Doug Jr. from Doug and Doug Gaming, and you're watching a Fellowship of Meeple. If you watched the last episode of A Fellowship of Meeples, you'll remember that I interviewed our local game store owners, Valerie and David. They run the Game Masters Guild right here in Crestview, Florida, and they had a lot to say, so we had to break this up into a two-parter. So today, I want to bring you a little bit more of that interview, starting with the question that I think a lot of us would want to ask, and that is, what's the best thing about running a game store? Of course, for a lot of people, if they have their own business, they say it's being able to work for yourself. But for me, it's th that's just it's still a job on some days because of all the stuff that you do have to do. But it's definitely the people for me. I have met so many amazing people and learned so many things and been able to have such a sense of community and camaraderie mm -hmm. with the people in Crestview and the surrounding areas, and especially the region with conventions and stuff that we go to. It's just the gaming community is amazing, and I glad I'm a part of it. I've been a part of other communities with other jobs and stuff that I've had and it's it, it's nothing like this. There's nothing like the gamer community. So it's sure. amazing. I have to agree. It's totally the people. I love having my own business. I love being able to work with you all the time and this is all we do now but yeah. at the same time I love meeting everybody else and hearing all the stories they have and oh, sharing yes. the stories and oh, yes. being able to just hang out with everybody. It's really cool. It is yeah. a nice community. It's like a family. It really is. Oh yeah, definitely. I have definitely found some people that are that I consider family now that I don't think I ever would have crossed paths with if mm -hmm. I hadn't had if we hadn't had the store so yeah so of course the natural follow-up to the what's the best thing question would be what's the worst thing about owning and running a game store distributors <laughs> no it's yeah. it's it's sometimes the 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 um the logistics of the shop and mm -hmm. not being able to to help the customer in the way that I want to help the customer. So really, that's that's where it boils down to is, is you with it being such a community, you want to help everybody as best as you can. And with it being a retail shop, a lot of that does fall onto how I can get the product and different stuff like that. And so it's it's really the logistics and the financials of, of running a business. It is very stressful, no matter what anybody tells you. It is amazing, but it is so stressful mm -hmm. and. Yeah, there's there's a lot of good days, but there's a lot of bad days, and you just push through them, and um, that way, because you know there's going to be better stuff on the other side, so and you, you just, just push through it. You just, and when you have your own business, and it's just you, you just can't call in sick, you can't say, well, I'm just not going today. It doesn't work like that. You've got to be there. Someone's got to be there. And then I was also curious, you know, with all the internet presence that the game stores now have, what does the Game Masters Guild, a friendly local game store, offer that the internet doesn't offer? 
the, the personal interaction. You don't, We're you don't get that anywhere else. <laughs> you know, plus, you can't ask anybody on Amazon, hey, tell me about this game. You can read the little blurb, you can see the pictures, but it's not the same. You can't actually yeah. hold it in your hands. You can't get feedback about the game. You can't talk about other play can't talk to other players about the game you'll hear yeah. you can do that a lot of time and we got lots of demo games here you can try them for free i mean it's just it's so much better than the internet and then the last question is if you were stranded on a desert island and you only had one game with you what game would it be well for me at this point in time i've said it to a lot of people my favorite game at the moment right now and i could do a lot of maybe different things with it sagrada i hate to say it's not it's not it's not a very complicated game, but it's got a lot of cool pieces. It's got a lot of colorful dice. I can, if I'm just bored, I can sit and just make designs in the sand with the dice and just, you know, I don't know, take up some time that way. It's definitely got that puzzle solving aspect so I can sit and I can actually play the game by myself <laughs> if I need to. Now, uh, for me, myself, <laughs> it'd be Dungeons and Dragons. It would have to be because uh, I would carve dice out of wood if I had to and I... I would I would beg my own little Wilsons and and play D and D with them. And if you were there, I'd beg and plead you to put for you to play. And you probably would for a little while. I and then would play least... Star Realms. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, thank you so much for joining us here on a Fellowship of Meeples. Be sure and tune in next time as we continue our exploration on the gaming groups and the people that make them up. So long. Hey everyone, we're back for another non-gamer insight with Sarah and Haley. And today we're looking at the cat game. So it's like Pictionary, but with cats. Let's see what they think. That was good. Okay, we're gonna see what Sarah thinks first. So the cat game is kind of like Pictionary. You draw a card, you have to draw like a person or a activity and you put these little cats underneath here and then you draw with a whiteboard over them and try to get uh, the other people to guess it. So what did you like about this game besides the furry box, of course? Um, I liked that you can draw on the cats because cats are my favorite animals. Mm -hmm. And they come in a lot of different positions. So some are jumping, some are laying mm -hmm. down, some are really, really cute. Like these are just little kittens. So it's fun because you have a lot of options mm -hmm. to, to use with your drawing. Yeah, you have to pick out which ones like work best with what you're trying to do. Mm -hmm. um, is there anything that you didn't like about the game at all? No, I liked pretty much everything. Yeah, I it's nice. It. It's easy to learn. Like, it wasn't difficult, right? No. Would you recommend this for people who are, like, trying to have a good time with their friends? Yeah, I would. Yeah, it's easy. You can play, like, to whatever amount, really. So, I think it's a good game. It's fun. Uh, now let's see what Haley thinks. Two, one. Okay, everyone, now we're going to see what Haley thinks. So, Haley, again, this is a cat game. It's kind of like Pictionary. You put little cats in here draw on it, it might be a person, an activity, and then the other people have to guess it. You can kind of play in teams or play. Everyone goes by themselves. What did you like about this game the most? I really liked all the cat puns there were. Like on the cards, mm. it was flicks, like with the word lick, uh -huh. and persons yeah. and professions and cat activities. If you're so a cat lover, funny. this is like oh, this your, is your game, game for this sure. Oh, this is why I got it for you. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, makes sense. Um, is there anything you didn't like? Um, no, I really don't think so. It was sometimes hard to draw some of the things. They give you the three options on the card to choose from, mm -hmm. and even then sometimes your options weren't yeah. the best, but you could still make the most of it, and it was still fun anyway. It's kind of funny when people can't draw. Yeah. So. It's the only problem that you could run into is like if someone picks a name or a celebrity that you didn't know or mm -hmm. something, or if they can't like see the way your orientation when you're drawing it, but it's really not a big deal. No. I think it works. Yeah, it works. Um, would you recommend this for people who don't play a lot of games? I absolutely would. I think this is a good game to introduce people to board games too because it's something kind of old school but yeah. with a new modern twist and it's super yeah. fun. Yeah, they'll have that familiarity with Pictionary and then mm -hmm. they can kind of like Just run away with that. On yeah. It a little bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. it's super fun. It's probably a cheap price point too, like not too yeah, expensive. It's not so too crazy expensive. I think you should check it out. So, yeah. okay, let's get to the final thoughts. Okay, everyone, those were their thoughts on the cat game. This seems like a good game with non-gamers. You can pick it up easily, and everyone will have a good time. So look out for it in the next store that you go to if you're trying to pick up another game. We'll see you next time, everyone. Cats and cats and pots and pants. I'll do persons and professions. <laughs> I'm so excited. Are you kidding me?
away. <laughs> he, couldn't, he needed the mole. <laughs> this is going to be difficult. I don't know how I'm going to draw this. Okay. <laughs> I can't do it. <laughs> Cow. If that's where you think that udders are on a cow, well, you are I, I didn't mean to put it there. Like, <laughs> this is not anatomically correct. <laughs> I got concerned. Who's hurt? It's harder than it looks. <coughs> I'm never going to get my chance. Oh, my nose hurts. Okay. Fun. It's just an interesting in I like approach. that we can talk during it. <laughs> Magic maze. <laughs> there you go. Yes, I've got one. Different things you can use. Why do you kept it family friendly? <laughs> Your cats. You write them on there. Sarah laughs a lot because apparently cats are funny, and now we have to do another take. <laughs> Jared and I were Sorry. Laughing. So, what did you like about the cat game besides this furry box? <laughs> what did you like? That was perfect. Hi everyone and welcome to TPL because we still don't know what we're calling this series yet. Yes, I'm the Broken Meeple and this is the starting tile where you can find out about new and unusual gateway games. Well, not today anyway, because last episode I did a special top 10 for you guys where I did top 10 gateway games from the last three years. Well today I'm going to quickly run through my top 10 gateway games that I like to teach from before three years old. So you're going to hear some old classics but maybe some unexpected ones as well. Better get on with it because... Time's ticking, and it's a short episode. So, here's the handy flat book. Number 10 is the absolute classic Carcassonne. Yes, this tile laying game where you're putting out tiles, putting out your meeples as robbers, knights, and monks in order to score points as the map builds out in front of you. It's a classic, it still goes well, best with two to three players, and you can expand it to your heart's content if you want to take it that step further. Number nine is the ever popular Catan. Yes, Catan is still on my shelf and going strong. I prefer it with seafarers, but even the base game of Catan is very simple to play. It's a good introduction to Euro games. And like I say, I still enjoy that light trading aspect, which no other game of that size has managed to get right. Number eight is Takinoko. Yes, this would be higher up the list because I do really, really love it, except it's getting to that borderline where I couldn't necessarily class it as gateway level. However, if you think that your opponent can handle this level of game, then Takinoko is this great tile lane game with a panda and the, and the farmer as you're growing little cute bamboo trees and trying to get points by scoring objectives. It's simple, but it's got a little bit of depth to it, but it's one of the cutest games you can play. Absolutely love it. Number seven is Takedo, yes. Takedo from the same designer, Antoine Bowser. This one is a devilishly simple game where you are traversing along this famous road in Japan and you're stopping by various points to pick up souvenirs, take a bath, eat some sushi, literally just go somewhere and get points my way. It's almost like a simple point salad, but it is such a zen-like experience. It's so light, you don't roll a die, you just choose where you want to move, you know, last person moves, and it's just, so like, ah, you can't help it. And it looks gorgeous to boot. Number six is Flashpoint Fire Rescue. Flashpoint Fire Rescue is one of my favorite co-op games. And this one has you, has firefighters fighting a giant blaze inside a house. It's, you can play it in family mode, which is devilishly simple, or throw in a few extra rolls to have that little bit of extra of an experienced thing. But expand it with maps galore once you've got the hang of it. But even at its most base level, it is still great fun and co-ops are a good way to teach players. Five is Splendor. Splendor is one of the classic gateway games now. You are collecting cards and using these poker chip gems effectively to buy these cards. As you buy them, they get you more gems so that you can buy better cards and eventually score 15 points to win the game. Very simple rules, but great tactical depth. The poker chips are nice and there's an expansion for it as well. Number four is Snow Tails. Yeah, you probably didn't expect this one. Snow Tails is a great dog sled racing game where all you do is you have the track, you have your little sleds with obstacles and corners, and you play cards, two at the front, one at the back. Two for your speed, one for your brakes. Except that if you don't line up the, uh, the cards at the front exactly, your dogs start drifting and you start drifting all over the place. Very simple racing game, but looks the business, very cute, and one of my favorites. Number three is the ever popular, ever known Ticket to Ride. Ticket to Ride has had so many expansions, so many different base sets, you can pretty much pick whatever poison you want. 
simply, basically rummy with trains. You collect these sets of cards of different colours, you play them, you put trains on a board and try to connect up your cities by the tickets to score at the end of the game. Can be quite mean, you can block other players, and you can basically pick whichever map of the world you like, from the UK to France to Asia to America to Europe, whatever you want, and there's something for everyone. Number two is Forbidden Desert slash Island. Pick whichever one you like, really. Island is the simplest and Desert is slightly more depth to it, but both are fantastic co-ops and game right. They've got little cool, almost like toy pieces in them. It's a co-op so you can teach it to anybody. And they follow simple rules of, in Island, you're trying to get off an island by collecting all the relics. And in Desert, you're trying to piece together this ship so that you can escape before the sandstorm effectively buries you alive. It is such a simple game to play both of them in fact, but they work so well and are so cheap, they had to be on this list. And number one is the personal pick I would do and that is Sushi Go or Sushi Go Party ideally. This is a very simple card drafting game. If you want to teach someone how to draft cards, this is the game you begin with. Cutesy artwork, even kids can get into it. The tiny little version for about six pound is like one set menu and so simple to teach and fun to play get Sushi Go Party, you can have up to eight players and you can interchange the menu once people have gotten used to it. That's the one I prefer, but to be honest, pick whichever one you like and use this as your drafting game. Whew, I'm brave. Yes, that's it for the top 10 gateway games list. I will see you on the next Throat Punch Lunch episode. Leave some comments on this channel so that I can see what it is you want from this uh, show, you know, what you want to see in the future. Honestly, your feedback means a lot, therefore I need that feedback from you. See you soon and enjoy your lunch next time so like i said new show no same show new title that's about it i want to thank all my contributors as i always do they do a great job putting out quality content and i want to thank them very much for that i want to thank you guys and gals for joining us taking time out of your busy schedule to stop by and gander for a while at the content we're creating i hope you enjoyed it as well well we're going to go ahead and get on out of here so we can start planning the next episode which will actually be next week so we can get back on track for our every two week schedule we took a week off last week because of origins uh, and we released last week's episode this week so next week we're going to be back on track with our normal uh throat punch oh there we go so next week we'll be back on schedule with our regular token punch lunch uh intervals and so we'll see you guys and gals on the flip side